Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Cinematic Excrement, the best show on YouTube called Cinematic Excrement. And it's time once again to journey into the wonderful world of superheroes. Today, we're going to take a look at the first family of Marvel Comics, the Fantastic Four. The Fantastic Four first hit the pages of Marvel Comics way back in 1961. At the time, the powers that be at Marvel noticed rival publisher DC Comics was enjoying great success with the Justice League of America. So they figured, if DC can do great things with a team of superheroes, why can't we? And so the Fantastic Four were created by comic book legends Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. You can argue amongst yourselves which one deserves more credit. I'm not going to because, honestly, I don't really care and I got shit to do. As most of you probably know, but I'm gonna tell you anyway, the Fantastic Four consist of Reed Richards, his wife Susan Storm, her brother Johnny Storm, and Reed's good friend Ben Grimm. During a spaceship test flight that went horribly wrong, the four were bombarded with a high dose of cosmic radiation. They narrowly escaped with their lives, but discovered the radiation had somehow granted them superpowers. Why is it always radiation? Reed, aka Mr. Fantastic, could stretch his body to various lengths and shapes. Sue, aka the Invisible Girl, and later the Invisible Woman, because she is a grown-ass woman and deserves to be treated as such. Hashtag feminism, hashtag plagiarizing John Oliver. She could turn herself invisible, obviously, and could also project force fields. Johnny, aka the Human Torch, could cover his entire body in flames, which somehow allowed him to fly. Because he rises, I guess? Comic book science. And Ben, aka the Thing, became a huge, near indestructible hunk of rock with a penchant for clobbering things. It's in his catchphrase. Recognizing how much good they could do with their newfound powers, they became the Fantastic Four defending the world from some of the greatest threats it had ever seen, like Doctor Doom, Namor the Submariner, and Galactus. The Fantastic Four were a huge hit for Marvel. Good thing, too, as Stan Lee was actually considering quitting the comic book industry at the time, but the success of the Fantastic Four convinced him to stick around. Somewhere out there, there was a parallel universe where Stan Lee really did quit comics in 1961. And what a depressing place that world must be. The Fantastic Four have been a staple of Marvel Comics for many years, up until last year when the series was cancelled. Or at least put on hiatus. But individual members of the team are still doing their own thing in other books. Naturally, with such a well-known property that has been around for over half a century, and with Hollywood's love for cashing in on anything popular, there have been several attempts over the years at making a Fantastic Four film franchise. And it has never quite worked. Why is that? On paper, it seems like such a simple idea. Just hire some talented people, give them these fun, colorful characters with a rich history that everyone knows and loves, and let them go to town. The story should practically write itself. And yet that winning formula continues to elude the Fantastic Four. And it's not like they haven't had plenty of chances to get it right. They've made four of these movies. How appropriate. And the highest rated one on Rotten Tomatoes is only 37%. 37! And even the audience rating is a solid meh. To date, I have never dedicated an episode of Cinematic Excrement to a Fantastic Four movie. And I thought it was high time I did something about that. But the question is, which one do I choose? Like I said, they made four of these suckers, and they're all varying degrees of terrible. So, what's a second-rate YouTube critic to do? Well, the answer is, fuck it, let's do them all. So join me, if you please, on a fantastic voyage into the history of the Fantastic Four on film. It's clobbering time. As I'm sure you are all aware, the very first film to hit theaters based on Marvel's first family was 2005's Fantastic Four, starring Yoan Gruffid, Jessica Alba, Michael Chiklis, Julian McMahon, and a pre-Captain America Chris Evans. But that's not actually where our story begins. While the 2005 film was the first Fantastic Four movie released at theaters, that was not the original plan. Or perhaps it was, depending on who you talk to, but I'm getting ahead of myself. As I'm sure many of you know by now, there was another movie that came before. And that film was 1994's The Fantastic Four, starring a bunch of relatively unknown actors, directed by a relatively unknown director, and produced by Roger Corman. 
The movie was never officially released, but somehow a bootleg copy leaked out and it survives today thanks to the internet. And as the only surviving footage is basically a copy of a copy, you'll pardon me if the video quality is not exactly stellar. The movie was made on a minuscule budget and it shows. I mean, look at this shot of Mr. Fantastic stretching his arm. Good gravy. And don't ask me why his clothing stretches with his arm, I have no idea. Oh, and this is the thing. Yep, really. He looks like a Muppet had sex with an oatmeal cookie. Now the original plan was not... that. Bernd Eichinger, a German movie producer, acquired the film rights to the Fantastic Four back in the 1980s and planned to hire a major studio to make the movie. Unfortunately, as the years went by, he wasn't able to convince anyone to sign on. Both Warner Brothers and Columbia expressed interest, but they feared the movie would be too costly to produce and ultimately backed out. And so, with the film rights about to expire, Eichinger had two options. Either cut his losses and let the rights revert back to Marvel, or make the damn movie by any means necessary. Fortunately, Marvel never said he had to make a big budget movie, he just had to make a movie. So Eichinger turned to legendary B-movie producer Roger Corman, who agreed to help him make his Fantastic Four movie with a budget of about $1 million. And even 20 years ago, that was nothing. The end result? Well, it's a movie. I'll give it that much. The story begins... In space! I will never get tired of that. Actually, it begins with three college students, Reed Richards, Ben Grimm, and Victor Von Doom. And I totally believe those three gentlemen are college students and not in their 30s. Reed and Ben are renting a room at a boarding house run by Mrs. Storm, along with her children, Susan and Johnny. If Mrs. Storm has a first name, it's never mentioned. Likewise, on whether or not there's a Mr. Storm. And little Susie has apparently developed a crush on Reed, to which he appears to be completely oblivious. He's dreamy. Is he? The really weird thing is, these two end up getting married. No, for real, that's actually how the movie ends, with their wedding. And why the hell is Reed getting married in his superhero costume? I know that's how it was in the comics, but that does not make it look any less silly. Now, to be fair, it's not like they got married when she was still a child. Reed didn't even appear to have any attraction to her until about 10 years later. And while there may be a significant age gap between the two, he's a grown-ass man, she's a grown-ass woman. If they want to get busy, they are free to do so. So there's nothing wrong with their relationship, it's just the way it's set up is a little... odd. But the same thing happened in the comics, so for better or worse, I can't say the movie isn't faithful to the source material. So one day, Reed and Victor are doing some sort of experiment on a comet called Colossus, haha, ha, no, that is passing near Earth. We never actually see this comet, of course, because we don't have the budget for that. All we see are a bunch of people staring in awe at a strobe light. And what does all this equipment actually do? Whatever it is, it looks expensive, and I doubt a couple of college students would be able to afford all this shit with whatever part-time jobs they might have. And yes, I'm well aware that Reed inherited a large sum of money from his father. That's never mentioned in the movie. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I shouldn't have to read the book to understand the movie. Unfortunately, the experiment goes horribly wrong. I'm an I'm an <laughs> no, but your equipment sure will. So Victor is presumed to have been killed by the horrible special effects, but Reed isn't done with his crazy Colossus experiments just yet. As we fast forward 10 years, which means the actors now look as old as they're supposed to, we find out he's built himself a fucking starship, and he's ready to fly to outer space with Ben, Susan, and Johnny to do some more poorly explained experiments on the comet. I don't know why they're taking Susan and Johnny with them. At least Ben is a pilot and Reed is a scientist. What the hell are Sue and Johnny qualified to do on a fucking starship? Hi, Mrs. Storm. Johnny and Susan go to outer space with us? Well, I don't know, dear. You'll have to ask them. Someone was paid to write that dialogue. I mean, they weren't paid much, but, you know. Look at you. The Fantastic Four. Yeah, like that name's gonna stick. Unfortunately, the experiment goes horribly wrong. Again. And the ship crash lands on Earth. Somehow, all four of them survive. They were in outer space, crash landed on Earth, and they're just fine. What? Not a scratch on us, and the ship, 
in a hundred pieces. We're fine? Come on, doesn't that bother anybody just a little? Even the movie doesn't buy its own bullshit. The four soon discover the accident has blessed them with superpowers. Reed has go-go gadget arms, Susan can adjust her own chroma key, Johnny can sneeze fire, <laughs> Moses, and Ben, well, Muppet, oatmeal. Meanwhile, it turns out Victor Von Doom is still alive. I don't know why he faked his death in the first place, but whatever, he's alive. The accident has left him heavily disfigured, so he has donned a metal mask to hide his scars and is now known as Dr. Doom. Oh my god, what is this? Am I watching a Fantastic Four movie or a Saturday morning cartoon? I can't tell anymore. Although, I suppose there's a third possibility. I am Oz, the great and powerful. Anyway, Doctor Doom somehow discovers the Fantastic Four are alive before anyone else does, thanks to the power of science or something, and he abducts our heroes and plans to somehow extract their new superpowers and use them for his own nefarious purposes. But the Fantastic Four are not about to take this lying down. What am I supposed to do with these guys? But, the fuck was that? You couldn't even afford to film a fight sequence? You just spun the camera around and threw in some sound effects? This movie couldn't be any cheaper if you sold it at Ikea. Beautiful, charming little country. Die, supreme and beloved monarch. After all the trouble, I want you to feel at home. Okay, can we either remove the mask or get him some subtitles? I have an easier time understanding Nirvana lyrics. Doom tries to stop them from escaping, but they easily fight off his useless henchmen in a very silly action sequence, and they return home to New York. So, my friend. <laughs> you know, I kinda love Doctor Doom's reaction there. But our heroes are not done with Doom yet, as he has built himself a freaking laser beam that could level New York City. And so, with their delightfully cheesy new super suits, the Fantastic Four pile into their flying car. Oh yeah, they have a flying car now. Roll with it. And they fly off to kick some Doctor Doom derriere. Hey kids, you know what time it is? It's Barbara time. And after another poorly choreographed fight sequence and aha, see, I told you it was a cartoon. They stop the frickin' laser beam and the good doctor is defeated. So as you may have noticed, this movie is not very good. The acting is hit and miss, the dialogue is terrible, the direction gets pretty bad at times, especially during the fight scenes, and the special effects, well, I guess they're about as good as they could have been for a million dollar movie made in the early 90s. But for all its flaws, I have to admit the movie does have a certain campy charm to it. There are moments where its low-budget silliness is actually kind of enjoyable. And it's not like the movie gets everything wrong. On the contrary, it gets quite a few things right. Sure, the Fantastic Four costumes and Doctor Doom's lair look incredibly silly. Hell, Doctor Doom himself looks like Darth Vader cosplaying as the Green Arrow. But they were trying to adapt a comic book that started in the early 1960s, and they did a decent job of staying faithful to Lee and Kirby's creations. And the Fantastic Four genuinely feel like a family. They have their occasional squabbles, but in the end, they all care deeply for one another and they have each other's backs. And that's exactly how it should be. They're called Marvel's first family for a reason. And despite how goofy the rubber suit looks, I really like the thing in this movie. The accident made him a hideous freak of nature, which naturally did not sit well with him, especially since his friends were still capable of living normal lives even with their newfound powers. But eventually he comes to terms with who he is and realizes he still has a place in the world and people who care about him. His story was handled quite well overall, and Michael Bailey Smith, who played Ben Grimm, and Carl Ciarfalio, who wore the rubber suit, both did a great job bringing the character to life. Though there is one aspect of his story that's a bit weird. Ben Grimm's story intersects with this subplot involving a blind sculptor and the movie's damsel in distress, Alicia Masters, and a diminutive thief known as The Jeweler, a character who did not appear in the comics and was created solely for the movie. Just before the Fantastic Four go into outer space, Ben has an accidental meeting with Alicia and the two instantly fall madly in love with each other. How does that even work? I mean, 
If I believed in love at first sight, I guess it could make sense for Ben, but Alicia is blind! I guess his face felt pretty? I just, uh, I don't know. But the jeweler also falls in love with Alicia and orders his henchmen to kidnap her. And these are hands down the most useless henchmen ever. Even more so than Doctor Doom's. Not only does it take eight of them to subdue a blind woman, at least I think there's eight, it's hard to tell, but they have to use some kind of knockout spray to do it. Which is shown in a POV shot. A POV shot from the perspective of a blind woman. Shouldn't that look more like this? Of course, Alicia wants nothing to do with the jeweler, but that's not about to stop him. Escort the queen to my room. I need to have a private um, consultation. I really hope that doesn't mean what I think it means. Alicia is eventually found by both The Thing and Doctor Doom, and Doom decides to kidnap Alicia himself, because... why not? She is really not having a good day. And at this point, the jeweler just kind of pisses off and is never seen or mentioned again. Wow, I sure am glad they went through the trouble of creating this character for the movie. What an amazing and important role he played. It's clobbering time. You met him for all of 30 seconds, and all he did was bump into you and break your sculpture. And somehow this causes the thing to temporarily revert back to Ben Grimm in what is admittedly a decent effect given what they had to work with. Seems lover boy is not quite himself today. That is literally the opposite of what just happened. The most hilarious part comes when Ben finally rescues his new girlfriend. I don't think we've formally met. And yet we professed our love for each other. How weird is that? So yeah, his story is quite silly, but the thing is still the best part of the movie. He alone makes it worth watching, and I actually recommend giving this one a watch. It's campy, it's silly, and it's incredibly cheap looking, but I can't say I didn't have fun watching it, and I think there's a lot here for fans of these characters to enjoy. Plus, at only 90 minutes, it doesn't have time to wear out its welcome. But it's still not a good movie, and if it was actually released back in 1994, the critics would have rightfully savaged it. But like I said, this movie was never given an official release. And it's not like it was shut down in the middle of production, they finished it! It was shot, edited, scored, they even had a trailer, it was ready to go! But someone pulled the plug anyway. As for who pulled the plug and why... Well... Depends on who you ask. Stan Lee himself claimed the movie was never intended to be released in the first place, and was only made so Eichinger could hold on to the Fantastic Four film rights for as little money as possible. But both Eichinger and Corman dispute Lee's claims. According to Eichinger, it was actually Avi Arad, at the time a Marvel executive and the future founder of Marvel Studios, who prevented the movie's release. Arad supposedly found out about the film after it had already been made and was worried a low-budget production could do more harm than good for the Fantastic Four. So he called up Eichinger and very politely made it clear that the movie should never see the light of day. So he bought all the prints for a couple million dollars and, without even watching the film, had them destroyed. Obviously at least one print survived, but how it found its way into the wild and who leaked it is anybody's guess. To my knowledge, no one has ever claimed responsibility. But one thing is certain. If this movie was never supposed to be released, nobody told the cast and crew. Hell, they didn't even find out the rights were about to expire until after the release had been cancelled. It was no secret that they weren't making a masterpiece, but they all worked their asses off to make and promote this movie and were proud of what they had accomplished with so little time and money. And it's a damn shame the rug was pulled out from under them like that. And much like the Star Wars Holiday Special, I think it is high time Marvel just released the damn thing officially. Assuming someone still has a print. It's not like they can ignore it and it'll just go away. They've been trying to do that for the last 20 years and it hasn't worked yet. Hell, there's even a documentary about the movie called Doomed coming out later this year, which I am personally looking forward to. Ironically, if Marvel had just allowed the movie to be released back in 94, here's what most likely would have happened. It would have played in theaters for a few weeks, most people who saw it would have thought it sucked, and it would have been forgotten. But by trying to keep it buried, they've essentially ensured it will forever remain relevant. Streisand effect, bitches! So just release the damn movie already. It's not like it'll ruin the reputation of the Marvel brand or the Fantastic Four. At least no more so than the Fantastic Four movies that were released. Speaking of which, 
we're going to continue to look at this failed film franchise next time. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it.